Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene at the tomb, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Clopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that, all, the, all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us. It is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had made known to had he how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Well, poor Peter was in the middle of a really great sermon when someone interrupted him. We heard the first part of that sermon last week. After Jesus' resurrection, his closest disciples would just not stop talking about it, how Jesus had been killed and then later was raised to life again. So in this part of Acts, this was our first reading for today, here Peter is preaching away proclaiming that Jesus is greater than the greatest prophet, Jesus is greater than the greatest king, Jesus is the Messiah, the savior of the whole world. And then right at the height of his oratory prowess, someone in the audience interrupts him and cries, but what should we do? Now, I am not sure that I want to encourage the practice of interrupting sermons, but I have to admit that that is a great question. What should we do? It's an especially great question for now, the season of Easter. Okay, we believe that Jesus was crucified and raised again. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Now what should we do? How should we respond? What difference will this make in our actual lives? Well, Peter, to his credit, doesn't miss a beat. He answers, repent and be baptized in the name of Christ as a mark of your forgiveness. 
We talked about forgiveness last week, how that practice was at the heart of Jesus' ministry. And then it was passed on to be at the heart of the disciples' ministry. And then it was passed on to be at the heart of our ministry as the church. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. The risen Jesus does not physically stay on earth, but he leaves his spirit to comfort and empower and guide his disciples. But lest we think that the spirit is only for Jesus' inner circle, here Peter is giving it away to anyone within earshot. Repent and be baptized, he tells his audience, and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, because the promise of that spirit is for you. But if that's not wide enough, Peter actually extends it even further. He says, it's also for your children and your children's children and for anyone, no matter how far away they are, who calls on God. Wow. God is really not being frugal with this gift of the Holy Spirit. It's available to just anyone and everyone who seeks it. When the people listening to Peter, to Peter's sermon and Peter's answer, when they hear about this generous grace of God, they are excited to accept it. They do what Peter suggests. They get baptized, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they repent. They change their behavior. To repent means to change direction. Becoming Jesus followers has a real impact on their day-to-day lives. The text says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayers. What should we do? One listener had asked Peter. And this is what they do. They learn together. They build relationships with one another. They pray. And they include baptism and communion in their worship. Not much has changed in the last few thousand years, has it? Those are still the foundational practices of the church. We saw them in that art, in the hymnal. Those are still symbols and practices that we have today. Learning about God, building relationships and community with one another, praying and worshiping together, baptism and communion shared. As we continue reading Acts over the coming weeks, it's part of our Easter season that we hear from this book of Acts, we're going to give more attention to each of these different practices. But for today, I want to make sure we pause and give attention to this last one, the breaking of bread, the sacrament of communion. Because we heard a great gospel story about breaking bread, and I think it can help us more deeply explore that question, what should we do? The gospel story that we heard from Luke, as you might remember, it opens with two of Jesus' followers. They are asking that question. What should we do now that Jesus has died? What comes next? They've heard that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was raised, and still they're not sure what that means for them. What should they do? The Easter question. The truth is that they already have what they need to take the next step. They've been followers of Jesus for some time. They've heard his teachings. They even have the right information, it sounds like, about the crucifixion and the resurrection. Goodness, it turns out they even have a personal encounter with the risen Jesus, although they don't know it at the time. But they get to ask him questions and hear some answers about what all of this means. Still, in the end, it's not answers they need. It's experience. It's not theology they need, but sacrament. Like Thomas, Jesus' disciple who longed to touch Jesus with his own hands, these disciples need something they can do not just something they can know. And what is the thing they do? What is the experience that actually allows them to feel Jesus' presence with them? They break bread. They share a meal together. The bread is broken by Jesus, and suddenly their hearts, too, are broken open, and they understand that Jesus has been with them all along. So if you're coming to this Easter season asking this same question, what should we do? 
the invitation is the same. Come to the table. Come to the table with your questions. You don't need answers here. Come to the table with your doubts, like Thomas longing to, to reach for the body of Jesus. You can touch the body of Christ here. Like those disciples walking to Emmaus, you can come to the table with your grief, your fear or confusion about what comes next, your weariness of theology, your longing for something more, because all of that is welcome here. All of you are welcome here. The promise is for you and anyone else who longs for it. Do you know Martin Luther was big on this. Luther said that what brings you to the communion table is not your own righteousness or knowledge. Luther said what brings you to the table is your own hunger. If you feel unworthy or confused or unsure of where you stand with God, well, that's all the more reason, Luther said, to come and be fed. You don't have to earn your spot at the table. The only requirement is that you're hungry for Jesus' presence. Or maybe you're hungry for something you can't even articulate. Those disciples walking with Jesus to Emmaus, they thought they were longing for political salvation. We had hoped that this prophet Jesus would be the one to free Israel from oppression, they said. But now he's been killed and we don't know what to hope for. But then they end up at the table with Jesus, and they are fed in a way that they did not expect. Though they wanted political salvation, what they receive is spiritual salvation, and it satisfies a hunger they didn't even know they had. It changes them in a way they maybe didn't even know they needed to be changed. Luke's gospel tells us that when the risen Jesus broke bread, it opened his followers' eyes to see him. But it sounds to me like it's more their hearts that are opened. Weren't our hearts burning within us, they ask. Luke says much the same of that audience listening to Peter in Acts, those ones who had asked, what should we do? When they hear Peter's answer, the text says they were cut to the heart. It's easy to make our faith a matter of the head, to make it about what we know or don't know, about what we believe or don't believe. But sacraments, communion, is a great way to remind ourselves that faith is also a matter of the heart. Sometimes we are hungry for Jesus' presence, even when it's right here among us. Sometimes we can't even name what we are really hungry for, but it turns out that Christ can nourish us anyway. We don't always know what we need, but what we need is here. Have you heard that line before, what we need is here? It's, uh, it's the end of a Wendell Berry poem that's about uh, the ways that we can find hope and promise in what's already around us, in the beauty of the natural world. And I wonder if perhaps we can even find it in the simplicity of bread shared around a table. There's this simple chant that just repeats these words over and over. What we need is here. Will you say with me, what we need is here. What we need is here. I'm going to sing it for you. I'm going to sing it a few times. And if you want to sing with me, it's very simple to hear and simple to share. And we'll sing it. One thing I love about this chant is that it is a, it is a statement of faith that what we need is here. And it is a prayer that what we need will be provided. So here's how it goes. What we need is here. 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 
is here again. What we need is here. What we need is here. Once more. What we need is here. What we need is here. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our Savior and Messiah, when we don't know what to do next, walk beside us on the way. When we don't know what we hunger for, feed us in your wisdom. When we don't know how to keep hoping, remind us that what we need is here. In your mighty name we pray. Amen.